Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we have one of those 1983 VSG guitars I was talking about last week. Now, in the late 70s, Gibson introduced something that's very similar to what the studio is today. The studio model wasn't actually officially introduced until 1983, but this is one of the precursor models. It was in 1978 when The Paul was released, and then in very late 78 and into 79 is when the SG came about. However, when these guitars were first introduced, they looked nothing like this. They were an all walnut body with a walnut neck and ebony fretboard with T-top pickups. Now they kind of looked plain, a lot of people said they looked like a coffee table or something, and they actually distressed some of the guitars in the early 80s to look like furniture. They would do black splatter paint in the finish of the guitar to make it look distressed, and they would take nuts and bolts and ding the finish up. Those are kind of interesting pieces of history. And then in the 80s, they rebranded the Paul and the SG to one singular term, Firebrand. Now for those ones, they would actually brand the headstock with the Gibson logo with a fire branding stick. It is also around this time when they introduced the Solid Body 335 version of this guitar. Along with those introductions came the deluxe model, which was all mahogany. But towards the end of the run, in order to sell more of these guitars, they started doing exotic finishes on them. This one is wine red. You can see it's a lot darker than a normal SG because an SG is traditionally more of a cherry color. So it kind of gives this guitar a cool evil vibe. Zach Wilde's first guitar was a Pelham Blue version. I've seen a few silver bursts. There's some gold bursts out there. There's just a lot of interesting finishes you can find on these guitars. They also switched them back to a more traditional looking headstock with the black veneer and gold Gibson logo. Now there are quite a few differences between these guitars and a standard SG, but I'll let you watch that other video on an earlier one to learn more about that. This one is more so going to be a comparison between the feel of these two models. This one, it's got the nice glossy finish. It feels more professional. It still has the traditional nut width, so if you're looking for a not skinny necked SG that's still vintage, this is definitely still a good choice. But this guitar, it just feels a little bit more finished to me. The only thing that really throws it off from looking super high end is the dot inlays. Now I like dot inlays if there's binding on the fretboard, but if not, I would prefer the block inlays that the standards have. But this one is pure mahogany construction, mahogany body with a mahogany neck and an ebony fretboard. But here's what makes these late run the Pauls and VSGs special is they get Tim Shaw PAFs, and it shocks me how these guitars are not more expensive than they are. Over 50% of the value comes from these original pickups. Something else that's unique about this one is it has the top adjust bridge, also known as the 3.2 pneumatic bridge. This was a very shortly lived Gibson part. I did a separate video on that. You can also check that out if you're interested in learning a little bit more about those. But I was never a huge fan of these the SG and Firebrand versions of the SG. But now that I've given these things a second chance, I think I want to buy more and more of these because these are great grunge metal machines. They've got such a bite, growl, and snarl to their tone. And this one, I love this wine red finish. It's just evil looking. I found myself enjoying this one a little bit more than that last one, simply because it doesn't smell like smoke. But having the Tim Shaw PAFs and the special bridge definitely made it a little bit more cool for me. So definitely give one of these DSG Firebrand guitars a try. I think you might enjoy them. So let's go ahead and hear how this example sounds.
Now that we know how this guitar sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. This guitar is what I would consider about a 7 out of 10. It's not really beat up, but it's not really mint either. You've got some scratches on the face of the headstock in this area, but thankfully no breaks, cracks, or repairs. Truss rod still works fine, has plenty of adjustment, and your original VSG truss rod cover. Once again, you have an ebony fretboard, very minor play wear on this one, and dot inlays. These inlays, I do like them. These ones have a little bit more character to them. And what I mean by that is that they're like more mother of pearl looking than some of the other ones. Because some of these, they're just plain white. These ones kind of have a darkness to them as well, which makes them look more high end. The face of the guitar is pretty scratched. You could probably polish a lot of this out, but this guitar has a lot of edge wear along it as well. I'll try to get a close up of some of that. I mean, it's definitely been played its whole life, but not abused by any means. It's just got what I would consider honest play wear. But, I mean, it wasn't looked after super carefully or anything. Original Tim Shaw PAFs, nothing's ever been touched on this guitar. Again, three-point adjustment, tunematic bridge. This one has brass saddles. Sometimes you'll find ones with nylon. And you have beautifully aged speed knobs on this model. Back of the headstock, our serial number is 82213539, made in USA. You've got a few dings along the side of the headstock and some edge wear, but no breaks, cracks, or repairs to this one. I would say the neck feels a little less wide on this one, but definitely not 70s SG thin. And then it kind of has a little bit more of a rounded profile. I'm not saying that this is like a 50s style neck or anything, it's definitely more so 60s, but it's got a nice roundedness to it that really does make this one a little bit more comfortable in my opinion. Something to go over here on the neck is it looks like something was resting against the finish, like maybe it was laying against a case and the Tolex impressed against the neck. It's either that or is there... It's either that or there was plastic or something that reacted to the finish that kind of left some impressions on the neck. They're not always visible, but they are there and it's good to know about. Now the back of this guitar, it's kind of interesting. You've got some buckle rash and buckle worming all over, but take a look at the finish itself. Remember those black specks I was talking about? I'm guessing this guitar accidentally got those. I can't tell if it's under the finish or on top of it. It kind of black lights a little bit weird, but I'm guessing that did happen at the factory because that's exactly what the distressing paint would look like on those other models from this time period. It just kind of looks a little bit out of place on this one, but I do believe it is factory. No breaks, cracks, or repairs to the heel. You always gotta check the heels on these SGs. SGs have never really been known for being that strong of instruments, but they're great slender, solid-bodied guitars. Under blacklight, you can see everything on the face of the guitar is good. Pickups glow the way I would expect to see just a little bit. And we've got super glowing speed knobs here. Take a look here at the sides. And you just got some wear and tear along the edges here. Uh, nothing too extreme. And then the back. It looks like it's under the finish. It's kind of hard to tell because it doesn't glow over green in those spots, but it might just be because that's a very dark black. I mean, it's possible somebody accidentally got paint or something on this guitar, but I'm really not sure on that one. The heel joint is looking good. And it looks like you might have a little bit of stand rash here that's invisible under normal lighting situations, but no breaks, cracks, or repairs. So overall, it definitely passes the black light test. The only really weird spot is the back with those black dots. This guitar still retains its original Gibson case. This is a generation three chainsaw case. 
However, this is the one I nickname Generation 4, the absolute worst version of the chainsaw case. A little bit more on that in a bit. You can see there is a sticker on this one at some point in time. But other than that, I mean, everything functions. All three metal latches are still present and just average scuffs. But here's why this version is just absolute garbage. The one thing that people don't like about Gen 3 chainsaw cases is that they're bulky. I mean, just look at half of this case. That's about the thickness of the original chainsaw case. That makes these things great for shipping, but if you're storing a large collection of guitars in these, it takes up way too much space. But the one saving grace for these cases was at least they had tons of padding in them. Gen 4 takes away all of the padding. Up here used to be a thick plush blanket about this thick of padding, and now you can see it's literally just lined with some felt so it doesn't scratch against the plastic. And it's the same thing all around this case. There's just no padding to them at all. Gone is all the padding around the headstock, and same thing with the neck rests, and they even did away with the lid for the compartment in the case. This is a really stripped down version of this case. I don't ever suggest purchasing a Gen 4. I mean, they do their job, but definitely seek out a Gen 2 or 3 chainsaw case if you're paying big money for one of these. It's not a terrible case, it's just there's better alternatives for about the same price. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this 1983 Wine Red VSG, feel free to contact me on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash troglys, T-R-O-G-L-Y-S, or check out my reverb listing. Thank you troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.